Gracious Father, we're so thankful so much for Jesus. Thank you for the message. Thank you, Lord, for calling us that we're unworthy, unholy, slow to speak, slow to believe. But thank you, you never, never give up on us. We're thankful for that. We pray for your Holy Spirit. You've promised that where two or three are gathered or more, that as we ask, you're more willing to give your spirit than we are to even give gifts to our own children. You have promised you'll not give us sticks and stones, but you'll grant us your Holy Spirit. We claim it. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Alrighty, <clears throat> we're going to uh, talk about a nutshell to begin with. I pondered this one for a long time. <laughs> I don't know who gave this title. I've got an idea. <laughs> but anyhow, um, this is a phrase that's been around for, for centuries. <clears throat> and I decided to go on the internet to a phrase finder. And I found what they call the, the origin of it. Pliny was a writer in Rome about 77, or AD 77. He attributed the phrase of, um, of a, uh, uh, in a nutshell, <clears throat> to someone taking Homer's Iliad and putting it into a very compact nutshell. And as I pondered that, I said, that's impossible. They had no type at that time. The writing was not on paper, it was on clay tablets, so it, <laughs> it could not have happened. But I have seen pictures of Bibles the size of your thumb, <laughs> where they say that every word is, uh, of the Bible is in, uh, in that. I've never, I've never seen one, but I've seen pictures of them, and I, I believe it. Some people do something on a pin's head. <clears throat> it's amazing what people can do. But this idea of, in a nutshell, simply means that as you deal with a summary and right to the point. But I'm so thankful for this, <laughs> this title because it's pretty broad. <laughs> it's more than a nutshell. So we're going to get into this. Uh, more than a nutshell. We're going to have some, some meat in the, uh, in the shell. And um, we need to re remember that there is something that is much more than a shell. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He breaks all bounds when it comes to studying. We cannot, we cannot find the extent of Christ. We will study Him throughout eternity. I read of one man one time, he says it's like, uh, like uh, explorers finding a new continent. And they first, they're on the sand and the shore and then they move inward after a period of time. And he said, all this time, we're still playing in the sand <laughs> when we're studying Christ. We will study him throughout eternity. <clears throat> It'll, it's going to be a wonderful time. But Christ crucified is much, much greater than a nutshell. In the last days, we're told that <clears throat> one interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up all others. Christ, our righteousness. Now that does not mean that there's nothing else to present, but that's going to be the central focus and it's going to encompass everything else. Here's the, the uh, that's the end of one paragraph in this uh, article by Ellen White. This is the first two sentences. The end is near. We have not a moment to lose. Light is to shine forth from God's people in clear, distinct rays, bringing Jesus before the churches and before the world. So that's the context in that one parable. The whole article is dealing with, uh, with Christ and his righteousness. And this was written at the end, uh, it was in December 23 of 1890, and it was an extra. So it wasn't a part of the, the regular Review and Herald. They published this separately, uh, in addition, I should say, uh, to get this out at that time. This is about two years, uh, actually, yeah, about, uh, about two years from 1888. 1888, the meetings in Minneapolis were in October and uh, November of uh, 88. <clears throat> but this is the first sentence, and this, again, is the last sentence in that paragraph. One interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other. Christ, our righteousness. And then this one. If you would stand through the time of trouble, this is a tremendous passage. You must know Christ and appropriate the gift of his righteousness which he imputes to the repenting sinner. This was just, again, a short time after that, well, within a couple of years again, of uh, the one we just read earlier. But this is a key. 
um, we may not have all the dots pointed or the T's crossed, but we can know Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter what happens in the world. We need to watch what's going on, but we need to be careful and get to not get engulfed with these things and forget Jesus. We can be sidetracked on things that are going on that are very necessary. If we look at the world today, uh, we're in bad shape. <laughs> but we're going to see things that are worse. The whole world is going to be anarchy. And it's going to be directed at God's people in the last days. So we need to know Christ. He's been through it before. And he will go through it with us. He will not let us down. He has never failed. He will be with us through the thick and thin. Whether we live or die. Now I want to read uh, Revelation chapter 18, the first, the first uh, four verses. And this, this is a picture of the faith of Jesus, believe it or not. Uh, but we will see when, before we're through this thing. In verse 1 it says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a habitation of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of the fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And then verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. Now in the, the uh, first one, we have the picture of the glory of God, that messages come to us, and but we're to partake of that glory, and then we can share it with other people. This is how it's going to go around the world, as we, as we relate, relate to Christ, by faith in him. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit a little later about the faith of Jesus, but I think someone else, probably Fred or someone, is going to be dealing specifically with the, uh, with the faith of Jesus. And, um, but here we have in the middle, we have a declaration, and this is, this is a repeat. Twice this is mentioned, chapter uh, 14, verse 8, says that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And then here it's repeated again, Babylon, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now Babylon means, actually the word Babylon is a Greek translation of Babel. Babel means the gate of God. The L on the end of it means God. And the first part, Bab or Babe, means a gateway uh, into God or the city of God. And so uh, the Jews are the ones that, that uh, uh, interpreted the Tower of Babel and the, and the uh, tongue speaking, uh, or it was where the tongues were, language were messed up. And they said, this is confusion. So they, it's come to us from that source that Babylon means confusion, and it does. But in this context, it's a religious confusion primarily. And uh, uh, it's interesting, and I, I was going to bring this in, I was going to show some pictures, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to now. But um, Jim Jones spoke of, some, spoke of something that when Dari uh, Cyrus came into Babylon to capture it, as he, left, as he left his nation, he had to go a little bit north and then, then, and then come south. And he went to a river that he was crossing but called of Jindis or Gindis. And it was high tide flood season, and one of his sacred white horses fell into the river and drowned. And he became furious. And he said, I'm going to make this river so low that a woman can walk across it without getting her knees, knees wet. They spent nearly a year channeling that, that riverbed. I think it was 180 channels on each side of the river. And he was true to his word. They were able to cross. A woman could have crossed with, uh, that way. Now, it's interesting that Jeremiah, chapter 50, well, chapter, no, chapter 50, 51 and 52, is dealing with, the, with the, the, the downfall of Babylon. And in there, it says that you will hear a rumor one year, and then you will hear that rumor again. 
And when the second one comes, that's time to move. <laughs> and Jones applied that. I think he did it accurately to this message here, Revelation chapter 14 and chapter 18, that Babylon is fallen. That's the first time. That's the first rumor. And then the second one is this one. And we're coming to that. It's going to come, and we're in the process of seeing these things happen uh, today. But uh, uh, the rumor has already started. It's here, and that was, to begin with, that was a, a moral fall in 1844, uh, the spring of 44. And this one is going to come. It's interesting that not only do we have these two declarations, uh, you have a proclamation of the gospel in Revelation 14.6, says the everlasting gospel that will go to the whole world, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And then in Revelation 18.1, it talks about the glory of God circling the earth. So it's the same concept. When you hear, you've got more power. You've got a double, a, a double duty of power of the Holy Spirit. And this goes back to Joel, where he speaks about uh, the former reign and the latter reign. And he says that the, uh, he calls it, in the margin of reference, he calls it a teacher of righteousness according to righteousness and that teacher of righteousness is the Holy Spirit and the message is the righteousness of Christ and in both the, the, the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost Christ was uplifted and the same thing is going to happen in the last days Christ will be glorified in his people both in word and in deed and here's a a statement, a testimony that has never been printed says, this is the one by Jones I mentioned earlier, <laughs> that this will come as suddenly as it did in 44 with 10 times the power. This is in the Third Angel's Message of uh, General Conference Bulletin, February 5, 1893. And I looked for this for years, could not find it. And one day I was reading in uh, Spalding and McGon began on page four, and this is what she had to say. I saw the latter rain was coming as, and I think the brackets were added by the publishers, coming as the midnight cry with 10 times the power. This is going to be amazing because in, in the 1844 movement, 43 and 44, that message went to every missionary station in the world. It was unstoppable. And it's, when this one comes, it's going to be unstoppable also, even more so. This will go to every hamlet, every person around the world. And uh, thank God we, have a, we can have a part in that. We don't want to back away. <laughs> now, the time of test is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin pardoning redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. That's Revelation 18.1 that she's talking about. So you've got here a, a powerful message that will, will uh, catch the attention of the, of the entire world. But notice this then. After the truth has been proclaimed as a witness to all nations. Now this is talking about Matthew. Matthew 24. Every conceivable power of evil be, will be set in operation. This is what we're going to see as this message is uplifted. Then there will be a removing of the old landmarks, of the old landmark marks, and an attempt to tear down the pillars of our faith. And that includes the central pillar and the, and the platform and the foundation, which is the sanctuary. And we find sometimes it's under attack today, both outside and inside of us. Now, a more decided effort will be made to exalt the false Sabbath. The false Sabbath is to be enforced by an oppressive law. What we're dealing with here, we're moving now from the message of the gospel message, and we're looking at something that's going to happen. This is a denial of liberty of conscience. Justification by faith in Christ alone and liberty of conscience are hand in hand. They cannot be separated. If we deny justification by faith, we're denying liberty of conscience. If we deny liberty of conscience, we're denying justification by faith. And we'll look at this. This comes out of the Reformation primarily. Well, it goes all the way back to Jesus. But I want to read something here that uh, is a little bit startling. This was in uh, about 20 or 30 years ago. The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. This is a man who is in the Supreme Court. He's dead now. But he did not like the idea of the separation of church and state. <clears throat> and this is what he had to say. No amount of repetition of historical errors in judicial opinions can make the errors true. 
The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history, a metaphor which has proved useless as a guide of judging, or to judging. It should be frankly and explicitly abandoned. He became the number one justice in the Supreme Court in his lifetime, served there for many years. But he's not the only one. I've read uh, of uh, ministers also of other denominations who are saying that the Constitution does not say that uh, there's a, uh, to be a separation between church and state. No, you're not going to find the exact words, but we need to remember there, the concepts are there, that the Bill of Rights, the first Bill of Rights is dealing with this thing, the separation of, power, of, uh, of, of uh, church from the uh, state. It's clear. And, uh, but I've seen pastors who in name pastors and evangelicalism that are putting this down. They, they, they don't want to believe it. And, uh, we're, and we're, we're going to have to uh, face this as time, as time goes on. Now, again, I'm coming back to Ellen White says, if you would stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ and appropriate the gift of his righteousness, which he imputes to the repentant sinner. Christ longs to clothe people with his righteousness. Revelation 16, we're going to look at something here, it's very interesting. <clears throat> there will be a, an attempt by a threefold religious union to take Christ's righteousness from God's people and also liberty of conscience. Now we need to remember our religious freedom can be taken from us, but liberty of conscience cannot unless we surrender it. Our freedoms will be limited, there's no doubt about it. But the conscience must remain free to God. And as we trust in Jesus Christ, he will not allow the conscience to be overrun. This is the one part he will not cross. He, there's a barrier here. He will not cross that barrier to force us to do what he wants us to do. <clears throat> Mankind is not like that. Mankind wants to force his way. And it will be, will be seen in the last days. It will be very similar to what happened to Jesus and all of the apostles. There's only one apostle that died <clears throat> uh, in bed, and that was John. <clears throat> All the rest were, were martyred. And <clears throat> there will be martyrs in, in the last day. <clears throat> but that doesn't matter. God will give the courage, the strength to go through whatever, whatever comes. Not everyone's called to be a martyr. And we do not have, a, <clears throat> excuse me, we do not have to have a martyr's faith until that time comes. <clears throat> and if it's called for, God will give it to us. It's happened throughout ages. Um, now, oh, let's go to chapter 16. <clears throat> That's what leads up to chapter 18. You got 17 about the harlot and her daughters. And chapter uh, 16 is very interesting because here the, the point here is the righteousness of Christ. And if we begin with uh, verse 13, he says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of Almighty. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. <laughs> That is going to be a focal point of the entire world. Most people do not like the message of Christ and his righteousness. We have to have something to contribute in order to get that robe, according to the people. But we need to remember that it is a gift of God. We receive it by faith alone, uh, by faith alone that leads us to a genuine re repentance for the sins that we've committed against God, and other people. But God is the one who will do it. He says, know you not that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. It's something we cannot drum up. <clears throat> the world thinks that this can do, that, that it can happen, but it, it cannot. That, that verse 15 is very interesting. Now notice, <clears throat> if we allow Christ's garments, and remember, look at that, it's, it's in the plural, it's not singular. If we allow Christ's garments to be removed from us, we will walk naked, and we will be shamed. We will be put to shame. Walking naked means to lose the righteousness of Christ as a result of surrendering the faith of Jesus in our own experience. On the other hand, if we remain clothed in Christ's righteousness, the garments of his righteousness, 
we will not walk naked and we will not be shamed. I mean, there's still going to, shame is going to be there. But <clears throat> as uh, Lindy said, the gospel is, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And that's, that's will be the sustaining power in our lives. In Romans chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, it says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Wonderful. We're going to come back now to the trio of ungodliness. Here we have the dragon, which is spiritualism. We have the sea beast, which is the antichrist of scripture, or one of them, but the main one. Then you have the earth beast. This is the false prophet. And here is a picture that I got from a fellow in Spain. <laughs> kind of hideous, is it not? But here, these guys have mouths full of frogs. And those frogs are spirits of demons. This is spiritualism that has uh, brought all religions together. And they're, they're after those who have the faith of Jesus and who have the garments of Christ Jesus. But we have nothing to worry about so long as we're committed to Christ. Spiritual, spiritualism will unite the beast and the false prophet. He's doing that now uh, in the attempt to remove Christ's righteousness from his people. And we need to remember that he hates, the devil hates, spiritualism hates the cross of Christ with a passion. He hates the message of justification by faith. He hates sanctification. He's hate, he hates glorification. He, he hates the coming of Christ. He hates everything about the scripture. <clears throat> Especially that which points out his what he's doing. Here's a statement from spiritualism. Spiritualism will sweep the world and make it a better place to live. When it rules over all the world, it will banish the blood of Christ. And that's from their own writings, page 72, Teachings and Phenomena of Spiritualism. We need to remember that Paul tells us in Romans 5, 9 that we're justified, we're having been justified by his blood, Christ's blood, but in that the word by is actually literally translated as in. We're justified in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now here, spiritualist claims, errors and wrongdoing must be outgrown and overcome. Virtue and love of good must take their place. Spiritual growth and advancement must be attained by aspiration and personal striving. Vicarious atonement has no place in the philosophy of spiritualism. Each one must carry their own load in the overcoming of wrongdoing and replacing it with the right. Salvation by vicarious atonement is a wicked and soul-destroying delusion. And that's from Ethics of Spiritualism, page 99. These are their own writings dealing with this. And then someone asked them a question. Then you do not believe in the vicarious atonement? And the, vi the word vicarious is simply substitute. And uh, by the way, the word substitute is not in scripture. You realize that? Neither is investigator judgment. There's a lot of things. A surrender is not in scripture. The closest you get to that is yielding. But so, uh, uh, surrender was the very heartbeat of Christ's method, uh, messages to us. Uh, but we need to look for concepts and not for verbal inspiration of some of these things that, that people are attacking, uh, attacking the scripture over. Uh, this is, do you believe in, in this atonement? No. Each must work out his own salvation. Each has an equal opportunity to do this when he shall have atoned for the wrongs and overcome the temptations and allurements to the sense gratifications of earth life. So here, pure and simple, Salvation by works, by what I can do, what I have to do and, and not do. They do not like the gift of Christ at all, whatsoever. And that's by, again, a spiritualist book called What Is, Is Right. So here are these beasts again, and uh, <clears throat> Revelation 13 primarily. And you have the faith of Jesus, justification and liberty of conscience. There's going to be a union against that. Um, the hands of religion authorities are going to gra uh, grasp each hand and then the devil's hand of spiritualism and the purpose is to blot out the concept of the faith of Jesus and faith in Jesus. This is what he's after, especially in the last days. We need to remember this union will attempt to take Christ's garments of righteousness and liberty of conscience from God's people. He's always been doing this and he's going to be doing it more so in the times in which we live. 
Revelation 16, 15 again. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. It's in the plural. And uh, Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, lest he walk uh, naked and see they see his shame. Revelation 3, 18 is similar. I counsel you to buy of me gold refined in the fire that you may not that you may be rich and white garments it's in the plural that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see now in uh, in the bible if you trace this out you find that there was an outer garment and an undergarment and uh, matthew 5 40 brings both of these together he speaks in the context of a context of a lawsuit he says anyone if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Now today, a tunic is usually something we put over the top of a dress or a, a shirt or something of that nature. In those days, the tunic was next to the skin and then the cloak was put over that. And the cloak was used not only for dress, but it was also for sleeping at night. And it was something to keep warm, warm with. And so uh, th this is the idea. You got the, the tunic and the... And the uh, cloak or the mantle that uh, that that people uh, wore at that time but let's look a little more closely at the cloth of the cross number one justification legal justification is in the death of Christ it cannot be separated from Calvary experiential justification is by faith in Christ alone sanctification is by faith in Christ also now, here are some thoughts from Ellen White. She says, justification means the salvation of a soul from perdition, that he may obtain sanctification, and through sanctification, the life of heaven. Justification means that the conscience purged from dead works is placed where it can receive the blessings of sanctification. And you'll find that in 7 BC 908. Justification means pardon. It means that the heart purged from dead works is prepared to receive the blessing of sanctification. But it's justification by faith in Christ. That is what does the purging. Justification by faith is an experience with Christ. This is being fought um, viciously in evangelicalism today. Uh, and a, a little of the background of this. There are some people who want to deal only with legal justification. And they, but they do not, they associate with the cross, but they do it with when you believe. You, you start it, and then God legally declares that, you are, that you're right. Many are ignoring what happened at Calvary. There was a justification at Calvary. And when we believe, that justification then comes into us, and it changes us. And then it continues to go with us. It's perfect all the way. Sanctification is a process of... of uh, learning to live, growing up into Christ, and our sanctification is up and down. But justification is always, always on top, it's always perfect. So that, you know, it's not saying we should go out and sin, but if we should fall, God's righteousness in Christ covers us. He does not cast us off every time we commit a sin. <clears throat> but he will, he will deal with us, there's no doubt about it, but he comes kindly and he wants us to respond to him, and when, as we respond, he will, he will give us the strength to go on. But justification precedes sanctification. <clears throat> the, the argument in the Reformation was that those who opposed what the Lutherans were saying said that sanctification must come first. You must be purified before God can declare that you're just. <clears throat> this is not true whatsoever. <clears throat> justification by faith is the article of true standing in the sight of God. Sanctification through the Holy Spirit binds up man's will and purpose with a will and the purpose of God. This is from uh, <clears throat> volume 13 of manuscript releases, page 191. And then here's one of the emancipation papers that Lincoln signed. Ellen White uh, deals with that spiritually. She says, Jesus knows the circumstances of every soul. The greater the sinner's guilt, the more he needs the Savior. His heart of divine love and sympathy is drawn out most for, all, for most of all for the one who is the most hopelessly entangled in the snares of the enemy. With his own blood, he has signed the Emancipation Papers of the Race. You'll find that in <clears throat> Ministry of Healing, page uh, 89. And there are other, 
I think this comes from the uh, youth instructor also. <clears throat> now, just before, uh, some time before this, uh, Lincoln signed the, uh, the Proclamation of Emancipation. When he signed that, well, it's like a president directive today, uh, directive. Uh, Trump is, is making his own, he is actually uh, turning back some of Obama's. What he, Obama's doing the same thing. Uh, Trump has come along and he's taking his out and putting his own in. And the president has that privilege. But if another president comes along, he can do the same thing to Trump that he did with, Trump, with, uh, with Obama. But if this goes to the <clears throat> legislative and it becomes law, then it's law. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when Lincoln signed the Emancipation Papers, every slave was free legally, but he was not free experientially. <clears throat> and there were, there were slaveholders who held these people captive. They said, you are not free, you belong to me. I have the papers right here to prove it. And I've read where government agents had to leave Washington and go out to the people and tell them, you are free, just walk away. And the, and the picture I had in my mind, you have the slave master say, no, you're mine. The agent from the government says, no, you're free. <laughs> so the, the slave had to, first of all, he had to hear the good news. Secondly, he had to believe the good news, that it was true in his own case. Thirdly, he had to reject the voice of the slave master and walk out on his own as a free man. Now, the same thing happens with us. And this is what Ellen White is dealing with when she's using the Emancipation Proclamation that number one, God has set us free. We need to hear that good news. Then when we hear it, we're to believe it. And that's why we say, God help my own belief. <laughs> but we're to believe that, and then we're to deny we're, uh, uh, the voice of the devil that comes, no, you can't, you, uh, you've sinned too greatly. There's no, there's no hope for you. God is not gonna help you. We need to, present to him the blood of Christ and show that we have confessed to God, believing that God has forgiven our sins, that he's exhausted the penalty that's for us and, and he doesn't want us to take him back. Now, here again from Ellen White, forgiveness, two, two parts. One is judicial, the other is transformational. And this comes from uh, one of blessings. God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act, but that word merely means that it is so. But it's more than that. It is a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation. It is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming from sin and from and uh, uh, the other of is, uh, is uh, in italics originally. It is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. So there's two parts to this, just as there were two parts to the Emancipation Proclamation. One was legal, it was judicial, the other was transformational as they walked out by faith. W. W. Prescott, who first rejected the message of 1888, and then he became a powerful advocate of it. And we're going to look at a statement that he had to say on the legal aspect of justification. This is what he said, the word justification alike in religious and in common parlance is a word connected with law. It's a work, uh, it has to do with acquittal, vindication, acceptance before a judgment seat. To use a technical term, it is a forensic word, a word of the law courts in old Rome in the forum. And uh, I've, uh, I've listened to people again, they say, well, there's no, you should not use legal justification, the term either legal or forensic, because it's not in the Bible. And I, there's two questions I usually ask along that line. Uh, or one is a statement, I said, that, that's true. There's, there's nothing in the scripture that says, but there is the, con, the concept there? And it is, right from Genesis on through Revelation, you find it over and over and over again. Number one, and then the second question I asked him, or I will ask, when did justification cease to be legal? It has to do with the law. The, it, it has to do with what Christ did in exhausting the penalty that was against us. If that penalty was, uh, was uh, done away with in Christ, then there is no condemnation that holds this over our life. In chapter, uh, chapter 3 of, of uh, John, verse 17, 
It says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now that condemnation is coming, or condemnation comes on our own choice. But God has lifted condemnation from the entire human race. That doesn't mean everyone's going to be saved automatically. That's not, we're not talking about that. But God has done something for every single human being. Every heartbeat, every morsel of food that enters the mouth of anyone, atheist, agnostic, it doesn't matter, it comes stamped with the cross of Christ. There's no doubt about it. Everyone lives because of Christ. That doesn't mean everyone's going to live in eternity unless they receive what Christ has done for them. But justification is a legal term. Don't let anybody try to uh, take you away from that. Now this is what he, he goes on to say, in regard of our salvation, it stands related not so much, not so directly to our need of spiritual renovation, amendment, purification, and holiness, as to our need of getting somehow, in spite of our guilt, our liability, our debt, our deserved condemnation, a sentence of acquittal, of acquittal, a sentence of acceptance at the judgment seat of a holy God. Not that it has nothing to do with our inward spiritual purification. It has intense and vital relations that way, but they are not direct relations. The direct concern of justification was man's need of a divine deliverance, not from the power of his sin, but from its guilt. And when the guilt is lifted, and that's from uh, his, uh, his uh, book, uh, The Doctrine of Christ, page 118 and 119, uh, this was a first a manuscript that he used in teaching classes at, uh, in Battle Creek years ago and then put into book, book form. A number of years ago, and I had studied Wagner, or no, well, Wagner and Jones, and, and uh, I began to understand this not from Jones and Wagner specifically until I went back and read them, but I, read, I got the concept from Prescott, and it wasn't here, it was another place. And I was so thrilled with it. In fact, a pastor asked me one time, he said, would you present something for a prayer meeting? And I had a chalkboard and I was writing things down. I'm telling you, it was a dismal failure. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't grasp the concept. I believed it in my head. I could see it, I could understand it, but I could not repeat it intelligently. And I said to myself, I will never present this again until I understand. <laughs> then I went back and studied Jones and Wagner and Prescott and I saw where they were doing that. Now Jones and Wagner and, Wagner, uh, and Prescott, they all dealt with justification by faith as an inward transformation. So they, they, they were clear on that. But they also dealt with condemnation and uh, acceptance with God. The first time that I uh, read this in uh, Bob Whelan's book, uh, he wrote of two aspects of justification. This was in 1980. And he said the Jones-Wagner message recognized that there was two phases of justification. One is forensic or legal, made for all men, and accomplished entirely outside of us, this would be at the cross, and an effective transformation of heart in those who believe, and thus a justification by faith. If you have the little booklet called the 1880 message introduction, uh, read that on page 74. When I read that, now I'd heard some things uh, by Wayland. There were some things I was a little concerned about. He was <clears throat> meeting with some other people, and I never heard a clear delineation of the gospel of Christ for a while. But when I read that, I, was, I don't know who was with me, and I said, he's got it. He, he understands what Jones and Wagner and Prescott were saying. <clears throat> and it was after that um, we were able to deal, with, deal uh, together with some of these things. But I asked him one time, I said, how did you come to this? And in the 1970s, there was a moratorium on justification by faith that was by the General Conference President. He told those uh, that were involved in this, there were a wheel in the short, uh, um, Mervyn Maxwell was one, Ford was another one, Maury Vendon, and they called them all in and they said, we want to deal with, uh, with uh, justification by faith and uh, <clears throat> what it means. And Whelan was given the opportunity to present these concepts. And Desmond Ford was there, and when he saw what Whelan was doing with two aspects, legal and experiential, he said, I can accept that. There was a man in the General Conference at that time, in the Sabbath School Department, he's no longer there, 
he was a feller, fellow um, man from uh, <clears throat> Australia. <laughs> we'll get after a bit. He jumped all over. They said, no, no, we cannot have that. <clears throat> but as I've looked at this situation uh, back then through the years, I believe God was trying to reach Desmond Ford at that time so that he could see that justification by faith was transformational. But it did not happen. It did not happen. And, uh, and he took, took others with him. Uh, now, again, Ellen White says, there is a great need that Christ should be preached as the only hope of salvation and salvation. When the doctrine of justification by faith was presented at the Rome meeting, now that's not Rome, Italy, that's Rome, New York. It came to many as water comes to the thirsty traveler. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God, seemed a precious thought. The enemy of man and God is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. If he can control minds so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience of those who claim to be the children of God, he can overcome them with temptation. That simple faith that takes God at his word should be encouraged. God's people must have that faith which will lay hold of divine power, for by grace you are saved through faith, not that of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not all will receive the light, forsake their sins, and believe the words of eternal life. And without drawing back, go on from one truth to another until guided into all truth. Those who believe that God for Christ's sake has forgiven their sins should not through temptation fail to press to fight the good fight of faith. Their faith should grow stronger until their Christian life as well as their words shall declare the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. And you'll find that review in Herald September 3, 1889. <clears throat> and that's just a few months, less than a year after Minneapolis. So Christ wants to put his robe of righteousness around us, and he wants to put it within us. We need both. Now, <clears throat> Mrs. White uh, speaks about Luther on justification by faith. The great do doctrine of justification by faith, so clearly taught by Luther, had been almost wholly lost sight of. And this was within 200 years of the Reformation. And the Romish principle of trusting to good works for salvation had taken its place. You find that great controversy, 253. This is what Luther had to say. This is the doctrine which we attack in the followers of the papacy. Huss and Wycliffe only attacked their lives, but we attack the doctrine. We take the goose by the neck. <laughs> he got right to the core of this thing. He recognized that what other reformers had done, they were trying to straighten out the behavior of people within the church, and it wasn't working. And he realized from his own experience and what this teaching of justification by faith would do to an individual, he said, this is the key. We must deal with that. And that's the, that's the one that the, the Council of Trent uh, dealt against. And by three, two especially uh, Jesuit scholars, they're the ones, when you're reading the, the uh, uh, curses that, that are in the Council of Trent, they come directly from Jesuit scholars. They control the whole thing. And I've got information on that, but I don't, I've got too much here tonight. Uh, Luther on liberty of conscience, justification and, uh, by faith and liberty of conscience. He said it's the most important part of faith. He, this is what he had to say, let there be no compulsion. I have been laboring for liberty of conscience. Liberty is the very essence of faith. Now this is the way it was in the beginning, but within a few years he turned from, he didn't turn from justification by faith, uh, truly, he turned from liberty of conscience for those who were more radical than he, some who wanted to baptize by immersion of all things. <laughs> and they had the Catholics against them, the, the uh, Geneva people against them, and some of the Lutherans were, were against the, what they call the radical reformers, because they wanted to follow scripture and that. They don't, no, no, you gotta do what we say. What we say. And then and they, what he did, uh, <clears throat> after making this kind of declaration, then he sided with the princes against these people, the peasants, the peasant re uh, revolution. And to this day, Germany, the, the Germans, the uh, Lutherans in Germany 
are paid by the state. They're paid by taxes. <laughs> and Luther is the one who's responsible for this. He joined forces with the, with the uh, uh, princes, and, uh, and that's what we have today. And they're dead. Now, Mrs. White quoted Luther by way of Daubigny four times. Signed of the Times, 1883, the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, 1884, Great Controversy, 1888, and Great Controversy, 1911. 1911, there's a, a few changes in the words, but uh, she dealing with the concept. But the rest are explicit that religious liberty is the direct result of justification by faith. Now, we'll look at some unintended consequences. Justification by faith that came out of the Reformation. <clears throat> the next thing that happened was liberty of conscience. From that came priesthood of all believers. From that flowed the separation of church and state. From that, religious and civil liberties. And then on to free markets and economics. You need to remember that in the, in the Dark Ages, they did not have free markets. And, uh, they had uh, a system of serfdom and pope on top, kings under them, princes or knaves, and then uh, the bottom, the ones who were doing all the work, serfs and slaves. And that, by the way, that's what some are wanting to take us uh, back to. Now, I admit that, that capitalism, I don't know if I've got that one on here or not. Uh, well, the free markets and, and, uh, and uh, economics, this has to do with capitalism. Capitalism has gone awry. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but we need to remember that it was, it was the Protestants who developed this. And in the early, it was because of hard work and no alcohol, probably no tobacco in those days. And they saved their money and they became wealthy. And then generation after generation, they lost their spirituality. And so we're in the fix that we are today in economics and free markets. Some are trying to do away with free markets and uh, some want us to take us back to the dark ages. Uh, but out of that also, the next step was constitutional government. And then the United States became the land of the free. All of these things were embodied in the constitution. I believe it was God given uh, for, for one reason or for a major reason. It was to free people, yes, from, uh, from all over the world. But number one, God needed a free country for the third angel's message to prosper and to go around the world. That is our purpose in the United States. And the people have lost that eyesight of, they didn't understand the, thir the third angel's message. But it used to be that people believed at least in some form of justification by faith. That is not the case anymore. We've got two generations that have grown up anti-God, and we're gonna see more of that as time goes on. Now, we need to remember that justification by faith is the very heart of the core of the third angel's message. And liberty of conscience is based on justification by faith. Both are centered in Christ. And the enemy, as we showed before, is trying to engineer the entire world to fight against justification by faith and liberty of conscience. And I want to come back to that statement. Of, this is the third time I think we read it. If you would stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ and appropriate the gift of his righteousness, which he imputes to the repentant sinner. We must know Jesus. We know nothing else. We know him. He will guide us into all truth. And then here's something that was uh, <clears throat> written to a lady friend of Ellen White's. And uh, she said, you can be as safe as though inside the city of God. And this is what she said. The message from God to me for you is him that cometh unto me, speaking of Jesus, I will in no wise cast out. Now, <clears throat> in, the, in the English, what do we do if we have a double negative in the English language? It makes it a positive, doesn't it? But in, this, in the Greek language, or the original language, there are two different negatives, and they do not block one another out. They don't, they, uh, it means, I will never, ever, no, ever forsake you. I will hold you by a hand that will never let go. 
Now, this is what Ellen White said on this. She said, if you have nothing else to plead before God, but there's one promise from your Lord and Savior, you will have the assurance that you will never, never be turned away. I don't think she knew Greek, <laughs> but she got the concept. It may seem to you that you're hanging on a, a single promise, but appropriate that one promise and you are safe. Him, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Present this assurance to Jesus, and you are as safe as though inside the city of God. Marvelous. And this is to a lady by the name of Lizzie Inns. You find that in 10 manuscript, uh, page 175. This is to a friend. This is about a year or so before she died. Jesus declares that him that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. That is, there is no possibility of my casting him out. For I have pledged my word to receive him. So this is more <laughs> than a nutshell. Jesus Christ is much greater, much, much greater than a nutshell. I want to deal with an application and then we'll close with this. The good fight of faith. This is the relationship that God wants to have between ourselves and Christ. Christ initiates and we participate. And this the devil hates more than anything. This is how we get to know Christ. How we depend on him day by day. Taking time to be with him alone on an individual basis and, and even family basis. The enemy tries to disconnect us from Christ. This is his whole business. He has to do it. Not to save his own neck. He's already cooked. But he wants to drag down as many as he possibly can. And so he directs us to things. He breaks the connection through things. And um, there are several. It can be pleasure, the pleasures of the world. It can be life's cares and sorrows. We can be burdened down with things that are just boring on us and can't, can't hold up anymore. The faults of others. This is an interesting one. Of course, you've never done this, have you? Kind of silent. Neither have I. <laughs> but it's one, of the, it's one of the avenues the devil uses to get our eyes off Jesus Christ. Especially when the faults of others are looming before us. We've got to do something about it. Well, the first thing we need to do is go to our knees. And I want to share something with a friend, a friend of mine. In fact, it just came to me now. Uh, he came to me mad. His wife had kicked him out. And uh, he said, I went to my pastor and he told me that I need to go and confess what she have done to her. What do you think? I said, I think it's pretty good counsel. <laughs> I didn't do anything wrong. I said, well, try it out and see what happens. He went to his wife, and her, her folks were there in the house. With, he went in and confessed what he had done to her. And then he came back and told me. Would you like to hear what he said? <laughs> no. <laughs> he said, I'm amazed. He said, everybody started weeping. <laughs> and they took me back in, uh, into the family. He was so absorbed. And I'm sure she had faults, but I think he had more than she did. And he was concentrating on hers to the point where she couldn't handle it anymore. She said, get out of here. And then he went to the preacher to see what he would, if he would back him up and he wouldn't do it. But when he humbled himself and repented for that which he knew he had done, then the barriers started coming down and reconciliation took place in that family. So faults of others. Now, if that doesn't work, there's something the enemy is able to turn the spotlight on ourselves, our own weaknesses, our own failures. We need to recognize this. Our focus must be on Jesus Christ, even though we may recognize our failures and our sins. It is Christ who will wash us from our sins. It is Christ who will deliver us from our faults. And I got this from the steps to Christ. Now read this. When the mind dwells upon self, it is turned away from Christ, the source of strength and life. Hence, it is Satan's constant effort to keep the attention diverted from the Savior and thus prevent the union and the communion of the soul with Christ. 
the pleasures of the world, and here this is where I got to, the pleasures of the world, life's cares and perplexities and sorrows, the faults of others, or your own faults and imperfections. To any or all of these he will seek to divert the mind. Do not be misled by his devices. Many who are really conscientious and who desire to live for God, he too often leads to dwell upon their own faults and weaknesses. And thus, by separating from Christ, he hopes to gain the victory. We should not make self the center and indulge anxiety and fear as to whether we shall be saved. Not even that. Rest in Christ. Put our whole trust in him. God, take me as I am. He loves to take us just as we are. He will never leave us as we were. He will change us, wonderfully change us. He will never give up on us. Never. He will never cast us out. He'll never give up on us. We have to turn from him. And even then he chases us. <laughs> but he will not force us. He still believes in liberty of conscience. The faith of Jesus demands that every man, every woman, be set free in Jesus Christ. And if they don't serve Christ, they can still be free, <laughs> as free as they, as they possibly can be. Well, that's it. That's more than a nutshell. But in a nutshell, it is Jesus Christ alone. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We do not deserve anything that we have today. Whatever we have comes from your abundant hand. Whatever we lack, you have allowed also. We're thankful that we can turn to you in good times and bad times. We pray, Lord, that you prepare us for the day in which we live. I'm reasonably sure that there'll be some in this meeting that will have to face the devil head on, but not alone, never alone. Christ, his angels, and if we're united to Christ, that is the majority. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.